the early 1900s in America, the European Dadaists came to New York City and they, as far as I'm concerned, they corrupted American art. American art was very naive art. Uh, it was basically uh, portraits of rich people. There were landscapes that showed the beauty of America. There was newspaper illustration and magazine illustration. Then this very sophisticated artist from Europe, which is a very advanced culture at that time, which was at a different cycle in its artistic development than America, which was at a very naive cycle. So th they came over here and they just corrupted American art with the abstract art and with the Dada art, the surrealist art. And as far as I'm concerned, American art kind of had a nervous breakdown after all this and they're kind of like, what is art? They're so confused, they didn't know what art was. They were forced to absorb all this sophisticated information which they could not process. So they had a breakdown. You know, I, sometimes I imagine American art, if it hadn't been corrupted by this European art, uh, the, how they might have developed like ancient Greece and, and developed into a beautiful sculptures of like ancient Greece sculptures. And that imaginary trajectory has been destroyed. So let's begin the thread of Ed, Ed Ruscha, who's, whose paintings are basically words on a background, a plain background. Most, I've, I've read a, a book uh, that has all the interviews collected of Ed Ruscha, so it's all based on his first-hand accounts of his own work. The most obvious thing that one thinks of when you look at an Ed Ruscha is, what's the deal with the words? One explanation he has is that the words are kind of hot words, like their, their currency in social situations and certain words reach a certain level when you go, wow, everybody's saying that word. He, he often chooses single syllable words, very simple words. And then sometimes he said the sound was important. He's driving around in his car and he has a notebook and he thinks of a word or he hears a word on the radio and he writes it down. And that's how he gets the inspiration for his paintings. So it's very understandable that, a, that an interviewer would talk to Boucher and say, what's the deal with the words? And he always kind of shuts them down. It's not about the words. It's not about the definition. When he first thinks of the word, it's just, it's very arbitrary. It could be anything. And sometimes he doesn't even remember how he got the idea for the word. Sometimes it's a phrase. He, he gets the word or words, and then he starts painting. And he's got a very disciplined painting method and I think, he, but by the time he starts working on his method, he, he completely loses interest in the word. You know, he spends a lot of time uh, measuring things and tracing things. The colors in the background, they're really not very important. The word's not very important. And the font's not very important. It's not about the composition because he always puts it, he usually puts it in the most obvious place. You know, equal distant from the edges of the frame. Rouché says, um, some people paint flowers and he paints words. So when I first see a Ruche, I am it does have an impact on me and it, it's kind of like going into a silent room and hearing a gong, you know, a Buddhist gong. Then I start to look at it and I start to think about the word. It's not really about the word. And then I might think about the colors, and it's not about the colors. And then every step of the way, when I try to explore more of the, what's going on in the painting, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed when I look at the word. I'm disappointed when I look at the font. I'm disappointed when I look at the color. It, it just, it's a gradual declination of my interest from the initial gong. And the second time I look at it, I don't even hear the gong. I just see a word. I, it's just emptiness. And then I start to concentrate on how much work this guy spent making the painting. And I'm thinking about how he traced it and measured it. And it's very exact and there aren't any errors in it. And that's one thing about conceptual art. You never see really any errors in correct conceptual art. I consider that a negative because when you see errors, it means the artist is kind of stretching himself. He's going beyond his abilities in order to um, reach something that he barely can comprehend. But when you don't see any errors, it's a mannered thing. It's, it's a, um, it means that they're so in control, they're so afraid of going out of the boundaries. And that's what he's doing in his art. Uh, in one of the interviews, um, Ruscha says that he's very influenced by Dada art. 
and Dada art does have words in it. He kind of links himself to that. Dada is image-based art, but Ruche is anti-art. He's not image-based. He makes an image, but it's conceptual. It's not about the image. His, his, whole, his method is very controlled and exact, and he's got it down. It's kind of like an assembly line. It's almost as if the word doesn't even matter. He, he, you know, he picks other words, and he's just got this very strict, disciplined work method where he's going to keep churning this stuff out. Occasionally, he changes formats or fonts or does black and white, but it's basically um, a nihilistic method. It, it, it's, it's so cold, his work. It's kind of a prank, like associated with the ready-mades of Marcel Duchamp. It's like he's pulling a prank on the viewers, like I'm showing you this word that I don't even care about, and I'm making it grandiose and gigantic so that you think it's important, but it's not really important. And he thinks he's clever that way, you know, and he's got this nihilistic method, this nihilistic choice of words, this nihilistic way of going about his art, you know, and it's like no feeling. It reminds me of this uh, Kurt Vonnegut quote where he says, how nice to feel nothing and still be considered alive. Conceptual artists are telling you what to think about the art and what you think about the art is the art. In this case, there's a nothingness going on. I suppose they think this nothingness is fascinating, but to me, it's ridiculous and boring. Ruche, after he finished art school, he did go to Europe and he looked at the great museums in um, France and England, and he says it didn't mean much to him. You know, he, he didn't really think anything was interesting. Let's stop right there and really think about the uh, weight of that comment. This guy is an artist. He goes to Europe, sees the great museums in France and in England, and it doesn't mean anything to him. Personally, that was an earth-shattering experience for me. I'm really amazed that he would admit that. This guy's got a kind of a tunnel vision. He's, he's purposely ignoring the previous art, which is a quality that Marcel Duchamp also had. He wanted to start brand new and not consider any art before him. Ruche notes only one sculpture that, uh, that affected him. It's this Bertelli sculpture of Mussolini. And what it is, is, is a, think of a silhouette of Mussolini who had a very distinctive face and a distinctive silhouette. And you put it in 360 degrees and it, it, he made a, a sculpture of that. It's a portrait. This is kind of a one-off thing. And it is interesting the first time you see it. And then you kind of think about how he did it. That's kind of interesting, how he turned a silhouette into a three-dimensional object. But after that, that's about it. And nobody really copied him anymore. No one did that for any other people. There's a lot of people with interesting silhouettes, and nobody's doing this Bertelli method. It's just a one-off dead end. But to Red Ruche, this is groundbreaking, seriously amazing work. I think he knows our history, but he's he wants to start anew, but not starting anew in what he's interested in. He wants to reject everything that's been done before him. Okay, so if he gets an idea for something that's been done before, then he gets rejected. So even though the Dadas did words, when he does a word, he doesn't he's gotta do it different than the Dadas. He doesn't have anything invested mentally in the word. Another thing that art history has is line and color and the composition and emotion. So all those things are rejected because he's original. His art is just based on rejecting things and whatever's left over, he's going to do, which doesn't mean much because art history is amazing and it has expressed what it is like to be a human being and being on the planet and philosophy and religion and all kinds of things are in art. As far as I'm concerned, he's like left with nothing, but that's fine with him because it's some kind of a joke. To me, he's not really an artist. He's an eccentric who makes art. Artists are people who are into composition, color, drawing, all these qualities that, have, that art has. If you look at Ruchet's drawings, they're very rudimentary. There's lots of people who can draw better than Ed Ruscha. It's not about his drawing at all. And like I said, it's not about his color. He doesn't even, he barely contrasts color and his compositions are nothing. He's an eccentric guy who makes art. 
And yes, I do realize that there are examples of Ruche using three dimensions, the Hollywood sign is one. He also did some apartment buildings and he also did some um, words in three dimensions. But the, the, the thing is, is that, uh, and, and he also did like some words with a background. But the thing is when he does these three dimensional things, they're technically three dimensional because there's perspective, but they're, they're, they're so dead, they're so basic. There's no atmosphere in it. There's no air in it. It's just so, um, it's deceptively three-dimensional and it's artificial and unnatural. It doesn't satisfy my pleasure in seeing in things in three dimension. And I think that's kind of a joke to him also. So then you move on to guys like Duchamp who did paint for a short period and then he quit. He was always quitting art. He thought he could run the tables at, in the casinos. He be, wanted to become a professional chess player. He bought art for other people. Uh, and then he would occasionally make these anti-art objects. Marcel Duchamp was always changing directions. Uh, he's kind of like a moth flitting around every open flame. So Duchamp is also an uh, eccentric who makes art. And that's to be contrasted with an artist who's eccentric. Paul Gauguin is an example. He was great at drawing, composition, color. He, he had content in his work. He cared about his work and what he was communicating to the viewer. But he had this idea to go to Tahiti to paint. That's an eccentric idea. He's an artist who was eccentric. Ruche and Duchamp are eccentrics who make art. You know, it, 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 it really irritates me the way that the current art establishment hype machine praises Marcel Duchamp. And it's interesting that Marcel Duchamp spent years on this glass sculpture, which famously cracked. This, this whatchamacallit sculpture, you know, it's considered a sacred object in art, while it's really a colossal failure. I mean, what kind of idiot makes a sculpture out of glass? It's, a, it's one of the most idiotic things you can imagine, making a sculpture out of glass. But Marcel do, does it, and it cracks like anybody would figure out in the first place, and he's considered some kind of a genius. It's like backwards world. He's an anti-artist. He shouldn't even be in art museums. He should be in anti-art museums. Ruscha says, everything possesses irony, nothing gets away from it. The evidence of that is that he doesn't really care too much about his words. You know, there, there's a, irony is very big in the conceptual artist's toolbox. As far as, as far as I'm concerned, that's what ruins it. I don't mind a little bit of irony, but when it's in the foreground, it's just too much. Irony is, a, is the opposite of sincerity and authenticity. He, so he's kind of mocking words. It's, it's irony about words. It's an insincere word. It's an insincere method of projecting a word. And it's just irony about words. You know, Ruscha is kind of like a t-shirt stuck in the irony cycle of the washing machine.